All right, everybody, welcome back. We're going to start our uh, hour uh, of discussion and additional questions uh, for our uh, for our speakers. I already see a couple of hands that are up, uh, but if it's all right, I'm going to uh, take the opportunity to kick things off um, by asking a question for Carrie. Um, so, uh, Carrie, uh, I'd like to follow up on on your offer uh, to talk a little bit about why you think that uh, ontic structural realism is important for scientific progress. I think you'd mentioned that if we'd had time, we could discuss that more. And I'd, I'd really like to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, OK, thanks. Um, uh, so I think it's important because there's a, so, so people people all, always, and with reason, ask question why metaphysics is important or what it does. Um, and there are people who say, oh, it's just intrinsically, it's just intrinsically interesting, it's intrinsically, that makes it intrinsically good, just like art's good and literature is good. And, um, and then you have the positivists who say that actually no metaphysicians are just musicians that lack talent. Uh, there's much, much better, more fun ways of, of saying something sort of grand and speculative about the world that are that don't actually match anything in reality, whatever. But then there's a very, what a, a positivist would say that the, or those who take a really hard line stance on metaphysics would say that metaphysics is only valuable if um, it can generate new empirical predictions or it can generate new theories. Um, and I think in that regard, you have to think about more than just theories themselves. Um, you have to think about the kind of rhetorics that surround science, like all the scientific discourse, um, because that discourse can affect who goes into science. And as we kind of, and it seems really plausible anyway from psychology, but you know, we, we know from social studies and science, like who goes into science changes the science that is done. Uh, now, when you look at these, the statements of Weinberg or uh, Heisenberg or Abdus Salam or David Gro or any of these people who, who kind of make these symmetries or fundamental claim, they very often kind of wrap it up in this other kinds of rhetoric um, that connects them to their history, that connects them to the history of philosophy. They see it as this kind of realization of this Pythagorean dream or this kind of platonic dream and start talking about the platonic solids and blah. And it's very romantic. And it's the kind of thing that made like a kind of kind of arty, not very sciencey teenager, like when I was a teenager, want to go into science. And I'm sure I'm not the only one. Um, and so insofar as you give a critical analysis of this kind of discourse and you see it as like a bit breathless and a bit hasty and a bit kind of overboard, um, I think it affects in good ways and bad, like who goes into science. But certainly if, if science had just been sold to me as, as just something about technology or something and not this grand platonic vision, I wouldn't have touched it with a barge pole. Um, so I think that even though these statements that particle physics make, as I say, they're not theories, but they're in the kind of penumbra of theories are in part of that scientific discourse. And that discourse needs to be analyzed. And one thing that structuralists are doing is doing that. Thanks a lot. Um, so the first hand I have is from Jerome, and then I have a hand from Alex. So Jerome, go ahead. Hi. Um, so this is sort of a generalized question for um, all three of our speakers today. Um, I've had a long interest in the philosophy of mind, and one thing that sort of strikes me as difficult to reconcile on a structuralist framework would be something like phenomenal properties. Um, we can maybe make sense of intentionality, I think, easily in structural and relational terms, but um, phenomenal properties, phenomenality, the what it is likeness seems almost to be something that is paradigmatically non-structural. Um, and I'm sort of wondering if any of you have any sort of ideas for how we can make sense of the what it is likeness of mental states in perhaps uh, structural terms or whether we might have to sort of limit the domain uh, of structuralism to the more quantifiable sort of sciences. Is it okay if, if we go through all three of our speakers and ask if they'd like to address this in turn? Um, so how about James, do you wanna, uh, do you have any thoughts you'd like to say about this? Hi, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I guess you know about this literature and this tradition of making those associations. So 
Galen Strawson, I think, um, he explicitly, you know, real materialism, he made this connection, he said, um, we don't, science gives us only knowledge of the structural properties and that's like the non you know, the non-phenomenal, non-qualitative stuff and that we know that stuff intrinsically and whatever. Um, I don't know, maybe, but, you know, um, doesn't, doesn't so much matter for the moment. I mean, we might as well proceed on the methodological assumption that we can do everything with science because, you know, whatever residue there is is going to be there anyway, even if we don't crack it. So, like, you know, we're not like we're missing out on anything. I mean, unless you unless you think it's somehow sacred to hold on to the ineffability of something, that, and that by denying its ineffability, you're you're undermining its value. Um, but I just don't think that. I mean, if it turns out one day that loads of things that are currently inevitable turn out to be explicable in terms of a naturalistic worldview, I don't think that will make them any less value insofar as yeah, anybody insofar as they have value. Um, so that would be that would be my response, but, but yeah, it's a good question. Thanks, James. Carrie, do you want to say something? I, I haven't got too much to say, but I mean, absolutely, it was worries like this actually uh, kind of ushered in a lot of um, uh, the early sort of work in structuralism in its 20th century incarnation. So uh, Bertrand Russell's The Analysis of Matter um, was really kind of, I don't know if you've, you've read this, but uh, really motivated by the idea that you really can't get in somebody's head. Um, so how is intersubjective science possible? And, and the claim is that we'll, um, you know, you and I might not have the same phenomenal experiences of green or the same phenomenal uh, experiences of 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 uh, of yellow, but we can all agree that green somehow comes between yellow and yellow and blue on the spectrum, right? That's a kind of a, a relational structural claim, and he tried to build up a foundation of science or um, on that basis and explicitly motivated by those kind of worries. And they, I mean, I I I'm not a philosopher of mind, but um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't think the, the, those initial motivations have gone away in a way, um, in a sense. So I remember uh, reading Nagel, uh, and he explicitly says, I mean, this shows how, how sophisticated my understanding of philosophy of mind is, that the last thing I read was what it's like to be a bat by Thomas Nagel. Um, but there he, he, he explicitly says, well, maybe there's some hope that you could get into what it's likeness when it comes to people's perception of structural properties. Um, uh, but everything else is just, the, I mean, we just don't, I mean, I, I, according to him, 30 years ago, we don't even know where to get started on that. So, so I think those, I think what well, those worries remain. Thanks, Carrie. Emily, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, I guess, I mean, I think my official position is that consciousness is supervenient on the processes going on in the brain and that therefore, in so far as we can account for the physical processes in the brain by structuralism, we can also account for phenomenal experiences by structuralism. Um, I do agree that it, it's in some ways quite unsatisfying to account for consciousness in this, that way because it's sort of, it feels intuitively very difficult to understand how experiences of what it is like could arise from uh, phenomenal, from st structures in the brain. Uh, but I don't have a better analysis of consciousness to offer. Um, and I, I think yeah. at the moment, I, the only option I can see is to somehow reconcile one, oneself to that account, in which case I don't think structuralism has a more difficult problem uh, than any other form of physicalism. Um, I think, but I think it, it is a difficult problem for, for any physicalist account. So I, I have a, um, a question or, or, or comment or something related to this. Um, so we talk about structures, of course, you know, as, as came up in, in some of the talks, we like to use mathematics to classify, to define, to, you know, lay out what these structures, you know, features and, and, and properties of these structures. Um, and, you know, and that's really powerful. We can say a lot about them. Um, but I guess, a deeper question I have is to what degree do we identify the structures with those mathematical descriptions or representations? Um, do the mathematical descriptions or representations classify, characterize, do, you know, do they give us information about those structures or are they to be identified with them? 
And the reason I think this is relevant to um, Jerome's question about uh, phenomenal experience and philosophy of mind is, you know, certainly there are people in philosophy of mind who are um, interested in the possibility that we, we could maybe give some kind of mathematical description. We could maybe classify, say, something quantitative um, about phenomenal experiences. If we succeed in building up a structure that we can in, that we could use to, to describe them in some way, uh, but maybe not take that additional leap and declare that they are nothing but those those mathematical representations, then is is that maybe something like what one might view you know the, the you know structural realism to be that we we have structures they are things in themselves um, maybe qualitatively different kinds of things in themselves from what we usually think of phenomenal experiences but to the degree that we can represent them and describe them with mathematical statements and mathematical laws, do they potentially fall under a similar category? I don't know. I, I, maybe this is a question for, for all three of the speakers as well. Maybe, I mean, a Emily, or, if anyone, you know, be curious to know what, what, what you think about that. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on philosophy of mind either. Um, I, I do think that possibly one plausible way of accounting for phenomenal experience would be to suppose that our mind kind of classifies it relationally and says you know an experience of green is the experience that it is because it's being classified with all the other green experiences that we that we have and that there's perhaps nothing more to greenness than similarity to other greennesses um, and that seems like the kind of thing we could kept kept you with a mathematical description but as you say it wouldn't be the same as saying that uh, the experience is the mathematics the mathematics would in that case be a, a way of describing what our brain is doing structurally to produce that experience. Great. So we have so, a, 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 oh, go ahead, please. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, I, I the sort of distinction between representation and reality is uh, one I've just been very kind of lazy on in, in thinking about structuralism. But I mean, I do know if you read, um, so I want to say a couple of things. So one, I'll, I'll, I'll say something on behalf of James that he, that he repeats a lot. It's like, it's, it's not like structural realism is just restricted to highly mathematicalized disciplines. I mean, he talked about the theory of the phlogiston. It's not like that was some like mathematically complicated, you know, uh, affine structure on a mantle. No, it's not like that at all. Um, so he's really just talking about relations, relations between stuff, relations between properties and lots of structures and structuralism are like that. Um, but I think, I mean, when you read certainly um, Stephen's book, um, it's something that he really presses. Um, it's, it does become a kind of burden of proof thing. Like people, people say, oh, you have these structures that you identify, but what do they represent in the world? Um, and on the one hand, that has, that, those questions could be really well, well motivated. I mean, you just have something like gauge, gauge, a gauge theory, like what structure does that represent in the world seems really, um, a, a kind of appropriate because gauge symmetry is all about some kind of descriptive redundancy, but that's a part of it. That's some a feature of theories. That's not a feature of the world. Um, so yeah, the, I think the structuralist has to say has has to say something. But on the other hand, I think a lot of the demands that are made of structuralists to give some interpretation to these structures and say what they're about is in the world. Um, kind of begs the question a little bit against them. I and mean, when you have objects in the theory, things like, I don't know, planets, um, massive bodies, you, you know, you don't say, yeah, but what do these represent? You're quite happy that these, that there's a kind of more straightforward representational relationship there because you're not really worried about objects as a category. But with structures, with structure, structures and structuralists, they want to reify structure and they point at theories as the guide to what the structure is. And then there's this extra demand that they find this thing in the world and do this extra step that maybe if you weren't antecedently worried about structure as a kind of existing thing as a category you just you wouldn't feel the need to do um so i can feel the push even with regard to these math mathematicalized the you know structuralist claims directed at really mathematicalized physics i can see the demand and i can see the pulls pull how it pulls both ways can, can i comment on that uh, um, yes please <laughs> I want to endorse a bit of what Kerry said that is sympathetic, um, yeah, because I think um, that is a point I would I would put, make what Kerry was saying at um, the end there, um, and also say that even though I gave the congestion example, I mean I did that to try to fix an idea of modal structure which wasn't based wasn't reliant upon mathematics, 
but it is definitely part of um, my view and um, lots of other people who defend structural religion that uh, there's a kind of um, ineliminability to mathematical representation in science. And um, I, I think of mathematics as like a language that we've developed, a conceptual language, um, a technology. I don't know how you want to think about it, but we, if it wasn't necessary to do that, get beyond natural language, you wouldn't have done it. And um, post, you know, modern science, I guess, you know, not just modern, but before modern science, it was only astronomy that um, was highly mathematical. Although, you know, Archimedes and, you know, there was some beginnings there, but um, I think, you know, what we really think of as science is so much um, mathematicized. It, even in chemistry, it didn't really get going until people started paying very close attention to quantities of matter and taking very fine measurements of um, mm -hmm. whether or not there was, um, there was, you know, keep, keeping track of absolutely everything. Right? So Cavendish and Lavoisier had to measure mass um, very precisely. Um, so mathematics is just absolutely fundamental to most scientific representation and a lot of the problem with the um, public understanding of science, um, popular understanding of science is that we use, we sort of strip it of its mathematics and you could argue that what you do when you do that is you sort of give the illusion of understanding, not understanding, mm -hmm. because it's, it's like trying to pretend that the bit that's not mathematical is the understanding, whereas that's just this like, tiny bit that sticks above the surface of the water and the real knowledge and understanding of the world is, is in all this mathematical structure. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think, I think that's not just true of physics, but I don't know, evolutionary game theory, use in biology, use in social science, I know you, you're seeing all this structure and you don't really want to have a, I think there's something else Kerry said about that. Uh, kind of naive view of scientific representation that people seem to often have, which maybe it does work for simple cases, but like if I think they are, I like using this example because it's, you know, when, when two or more are gathered together, they should talk about the pandemic, right? So the R, R number, I mean, it clearly is part of a representation of reality, but we don't think there's something in the world, this like element of reality, which is the, the value of R, because R is a construct in a model that uh, assumes all of these false things, like everybody's got the same um, probability of infecting others. Anyway, I'll shut up. Sorry. Go mm. on. Can, I just add, can I just add to that, though? I mean, I think. Uh... Just to go back to what James was just saying at the beginning there, you know, these people often think of the scientific revolution and when the sciences started really making progress, you think of it in terms of mechanization. There's another reading of the scientific revolution in which it's really mathematicalization that starts to permit progress of a sort that just has not really been um, manifest in human history before. And it's, um, it's, it is hard not to think of mathematics as almost having this slightly, almost like magic, like it, it does something to our representations um, that makes them so successful that it makes it very hard to not think that they're really, that this mathematical aspect is latching onto something really important. Um, but I mean, for me, the way that I see the power of thinking about, you know, I talked about the structural stances as, as being one to just remember at all times that the language of physics is mathematics. You see that very powerfully and played out very powerfully in, in metaphysics in the following way. Um, metaphysicians speculate on the world in ways that are seem very kind of unconstrained and a bit silly. Um, and part of that is because they treat their theories as just these bits of predicate calculus, right? When you can, A is F, it kind of represents, is the kind of key tool that you, representative tool that you have for talking about the world. Um, and it's very easy when you're working in that framework um, to, to not feel that you're under any very significant constraints. Um, you know, you can talk about a dog on the moon, you can talk about a tonky donkey, you can this, that and the other, it's, it's fine, it all makes sense, it, it can all be because it can all be represented within this framework. When you're dealing with mathematical theories, um, 
it's actually very difficult to write down equations that are actually well defined. Um, you know, you can write down a kind of arbitrary equation, and the kind of the idea, the 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 the, the chance that it has like a well defined limit is like you know zero basically. Um, uh, and that's something that I really feel with theorizing about the fundamental. When you think about the fundamental in physics as something that's got to be well defined in a limit, you're massively constrained in what you can talk about. Um, and where there's constraints, there's content. So I just think it gives a much, much more contentful metaphysics. I'd like to go on to our next question. Uh, so I have a question from Alex and then Jeremy. Hi, um, thanks. I really enjoyed all of those talks. I think that this question is kind of not entirely well formed and but relates to some of the things that we said before. So maybe particularly to Kerry, but also in general, I was wondering, I think I got this from like David Papineau, the idea that there's a sort of triviality to claims about structural realism is all you can end up ever knowing or referring to are like the sort of relational properties rather than the intrinsic properties. And so if we're trying to say, well, let's throw away the intrinsic properties and that's just the right way to go. And it's not that kind of deep or profound a claim. And so I was wondering how that relates to this kind of view of structuralism as a stance. Is it like the same view or is there something different about what you're saying from that or do you, yeah, maybe that's it. But then I'm also interested to see what the others think about that kind of way of thinking about structure. So what's the trivia? You throw away intrinsic properties, but you didn't need them anyway. Is you that could it? never really refer to the intrinsic properties of things. You can never come to know them because you can only ever come to know or refer to things that you're related to in some way. And the intrinsic okay. properties are kind of hidden within in some sense. Right, but the fact that you have to be related to something doesn't mean that that something can't be intrinsic and not itself relational. I'm trying to think of a good analogy, but um, I mean, if you're happy with the idea that, that the idea that something has a geometry, right, is a kind of intrinsic feature of it, that doesn't mean that that thing cannot thereby, perhaps in virtue of its geometry, have all kinds of, say, causal powers that allow me to um, get in, you know, to get in touch with it. So think about dispositional essentialists, right? They think all the fundamental properties are intrinsic typically, but they also think that they're dispositional and it's of their nature to interact with you. So the structuralist then is end up and ending up denying the claim that there's something, um, they're ending up denying that th there are any of these dispositions which are had by the thing itself and they're only had in the kind of network of relations. Is that the... Well, I think that it's a kind of fallacy to think that some fact about the way that you interact with something can massively constrains the way that it can be, that thing can be, or the way that you know about something um, puts these uh, constraints on the nature of a thing such that it can only have, it can only have the same features as the relation in which I stand into it. Um, that just doesn't seem right at all. Um, and also, I mean, you know, these different paths into structural realism. So uh, uh, Jerome's question was thinking, was, was, was kind of got us much more in touch with early structuralism, which is, which Stathis Silos refers to as what the upward path to structural realism. When you, wor you worry about the human sensorium, how you know prime qualitative properties like color get translated into nerves and make you know experiences happen happen to you, um, which as we know only ever leads to a, as a way of thinking about the world that only ever leads you to some kind of skepticism. Although in this case, a structural realism that you know those electric impulses they can't take colors from one side to the other, but they can take they can be isomorphic to whatever it is that they're in touch with. Um, that's one path into structural realism, but the other path and the one that I take is the Daumer path where you take physical theory and you know, you're just a naturalist and you take physical theory that exists to tell you about the world um, and, you, and you interpret that. And there you're not really worrying. I mean, of course their empirical input has to come in at some point, but it doesn't seem as relevant when thinking about the nature of what you're theorizing about that you, your relation to the external world has to be mediated by one or other sensory relation. 
Okay, thanks, I hope. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Jeremy? Yeah, I, I actually maybe just have a finger on that. Um, I, I was curious about um, uh, it, it in, in terms in terms of pinning down what's what's contentful about structure. Uh, part of it, and, and this I think is maybe tying into a point that Carrie raised about um, um, uh, we, we we can we can convene on on knowledge of structure. There's a sense that we can convene on knowledge of structure when we can't convene on knowledge of other things. And um, uh, it it struck me that. Um, uh, uh, the application in, in Emily's talk is like a good example of this, right? So, so while, while certain ontological claims uh, about, say, measurement might remain uh, uh, intransigent, uh, uh, we can uh, convene on, on something ontologically hefty uh, within a, a, a program uh, that's focused on on exploring or cashing out a notion of structure. Actually, that, that maybe maybe segues in, into what I wanted to ask. Um, which was um, Francesca in the chat brought up a point earlier about about how pinning pinning down uh, our hopes uh, uh, of cashing out structure with with one precise mathematical notion uh, is maybe too limiting. Um, and and I, and I thought maybe uh, in particular, Carrie, there might have been a way to read um, uh, your proposal at the end that what it means to be structuralist as a stance. Is is to start to to sort of carton off things that don't count as structure, um, but but maybe that's content specific. So so maybe maybe I guess I wanted to ask um, if you could speak a little bit more to that, um, uh, how how to apply that stance, um, and I guess in particular, right? Like um, uh, Emily, I'm I'm also curious if if um, you think that uh, what you're doing like like fits into this proposal, right? In terms of, in terms of uh, uh, cashing out. Uh, what a structural stance would look like. So to answer that, I actually wanna I want to pick on James. So um, I wanted to ask James the question that I, I raised at the end of the talk. What does if structuralism is more than a stance, it's got to rule out certain things as counting as structures. Just like as you argue, if physicalism is going to count as sorry, it's going to be more than a stance, it has to it has to rule certain things out as physical. Um, how what would you say? Um, what, what's the analogy in the physical case to structure? I don't get that big of an argument because I just thought structuralism is, um, you know, sort of generic view that you can take about all sorts of things and it's really separable from, I mean, I would have thought naturalism is a stance here, really. Um, so, um, you know, naturalism or physicalism or something is the stance bit. And uh, I mean, if you if you want to uh, if you want to say structuralism is, is a stance, it's a stance within that already. Um, that's all. That's already sort of presupposed in this context of structuralism. Um, so what does it rule out? Well, look, I think Don Ross and I were saying this. You know, it, look, maybe we're wrong. You know, maybe it will just turn out that in twenty years' time there'll be this new, new physics in which everything will be point particles with intrinsic properties, and then we'll be wrong. But um, it doesn't seem likely. And likewise, if you look at lots of social sciences, there's lots of stuff in sociology about the relational subject, about needing to understand subjects in terms of relation. And I just, I just you know, I mean, what, what it would mean for us to be wrong would be for it to be no longer fecund for science to work that way. And Obviously, I wouldn't be defending the view if I thought that was going to happen. But, but I mean, but it could. I mean, you know, you, you could somehow you could imagine some sort of defeasible grounds for thinking that that structuralism, you know, wasn't the way to go. Um, I guess. So, if if structure if the structures of physics can determine the fundamental kinds. As I've argued, that that's that's still compatible with structuralism, if as long as they're not point particles with intrinsic properties. So my argument doesn't 
All right, well, it depends on you. Yeah, yeah. So, so the positive bit of what I was talking about, anyway, a large part of it was about commitment to modal structure. And you can sort of, that, that, that doesn't say anything about where we get knowledge of fundamental kinds or anything. It's a very generic, general thesis, right? But one that still is non, non trivial, not empty, not vacuous, not tautological. The substantive kind of metaphysical commitment, which you might or might not have. Um, but, um, so what was your, other point, your point was that, so what exactly, so. Um, so if you say like, structural is falsified if and when physics posits point particles with intrinsic properties. Oh, right, so so the, yeah. the, the kinds of the standard model are not, perhaps not fundamentally point particles, that doesn't, that's not a falsification of structuralism. So I'm not, I'm, I'm wrong in saying that the standard model as it stands isn't account, doesn't falsify structural realism. I would claim so, yeah, because I would say, um, I mean, along the lines that you suggested that someone might say that the, um, the standard model makes fields more fundamental than particles and the particles are constrained by the symmetries that seem to hold at the level of fields, even when we're not talking about states, but the states of definite particle number. Um, and you know, no one's got no one's got a clue how to be a realist about fields, other than by saying, well, you know, they kind of the mathematical structure of quantum field theory tells us things about about the world and gives us, you know, it does give rise to projectable generalizations. It's it's not. I wouldn't want to be an instrumentalist about it because I would say, you know, we should believe in fields and we should, well, we should believe in certainly we should believe stuff like about the relative strengths of the different couplings and um, you know there's lots of things that you want to be realist about. Um, but do we get a picture there of self-subsistent entities in, in quantum field theory? I mean I, don't know. I have a bit of a finger on this. This might take things in a slightly different direction, so I apologize if this does. Uh, and this is a question, I think, directly for James, but I'd, I'd also be interested to hear what some of our other speakers think about this and everybody. Um, so, you know, Sean, Sean Carroll was here before. He's not here now. I'm, I'm reluctant to bring this up without him, without him here. But, you know, in the past, I've asked him about, you know, what does he think of the universal wave function of the Everettian approach to quantum mechanics? Uh, and I think there's there's an argument that could be made. I don't know if he would make it, so I won't put words in his mouth. But you know, for the purposes of present discussion, I think an argument could be made that the universal wave function uh, is an object and it has intrinsic properties, those properties being its amplitudes uh, along each of the energy eigenstates uh, of you know, the Hamiltonian of nature. Maybe you could think of those, uh, you know, quantum mechanical amplitudes or, or components along the energy eigenstates as as relational between the universal wave function and the Hamiltonian of the universe. Um, but uh, you know, I think an argument made that the wave function, the Everett approach, is an object with these intrinsic properties. But I'm curious to know, James, if you if you would see it that way, or if universal wave function is so different qualitatively from things traditionally regarded as objects like Newtonian particles, that really it, it is a structure, not an object. Right, look, I mean, I, so I've written a bit about this. So what do you mean by object, right? So if you take a very thin notion of object, object is just the reference of a singular term or the value of a, of a variable. And then as I've argued, you, know, you could say, well, structures are objects for Steve French, right? Because they're the things he quantifies over. So it, there's got to be saying something else when you say in contrast objects with relational structures but what exactly is that well it turns out there's no union vocality about that in the literature so some people think well objects involve like what we really mean is individuals and then we've got some extra criteria that we impose on individuals or so what would that be and it could be absolute discernibility or it could be some other kind of discernibility or it could be being countable as well as uh, aggregatable, or it could be identity over time. And, um, you know, it just turns out there's just no consensus at all about what an object is, what an individual is, what the difference is between the two, if there is one, 
whether an entity is something different again or it's just the same thing. Um, Klein says no entity without identity, so I think he thinks individuals, objects, and entities are all the same thing. Um, but you know, if you do second order logic, then you quantify over properties, and you know, I, I, so I, I just think I don't want to make a big thing out of the denial of objects. I mean, what I really wanted to do in um, early work and still to some extent is just sort of demolish a particular conception of objects which and the way the world is which people seem to have but not really to put anything particular in its place apart from um, probably a more pragmatic attitude that follows the science so I mean if the science is talking about processes then I don't propose as a philosopher to argue that there are any processes and um, I mean, in quantum field theory, presumably, if we're going to have an ontology of them, we're going to have to have an ontology of propagators or something. Um, now, what exact categories do those things fit into? Uh, I mean, my Just thought really about that is why should you think that um, prior conceptual categories will be apt for science when the whole point of science is to be conceptually innovative in order to enable us to increase our understanding of the world? I mean, we're not. Aristotle innovated. Aristotle is a massive innovator, and um, we've innovated since then. And science is a repository of a lot of conceptual innovation as well as empirical knowledge. And um, I, but know, just to yeah. say, James, like just when you say that you didn't, there's nothing you want to rule out. What you want to put in place is a pragmatic attitude. That that's just saying structuralism's a stance. That's like a statement that structuralism is a stance. Well, so I think naturalism is a stance. So, um, so, I mean, the first chapter of Everything Must Go is about stances. Yeah. So, yep. so half, that, half that chapter is about Van Praat and, and how we want to have both the materialist stance. He doesn't call it the physicalist stance, he calls it the materialist stance. We want to have half the, uh, we want to have the good bits of the materialist stance and the empiricist stance. Um, I mean, so, uh, I think that's right. Um, so yeah, I don't really mind if it's a stance. Um, although I'm never too sure what that means it, 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 in a way. I mean, I mean, it depends what you think hangs on saying it's a stance. I mean, I think I've got propositions that I'm defending. So it's not just, it's not just a posture. <laughs> But um, the thing I wanted to say was like what you said before, Kerry, is about there seems to be this magic to mathematical representation. I mean, that's why I put that thing about the Timaeus in, right? Because the thing was completely, the Timaeus is completely insane. Right? It begins with um, one, two, three. And Socrates is counting his interlocutors. So he, Plato's giving us a hint about how important triangles in mathematics is going to be. Then he goes on to give us a count of the four elements. And it's Empedocles is four elements. But each one's got a different nature because of the different kinds of triangles and the way they make it up. Right now, if you what Plato says, what what Timaeus says about this is that it's a it's what he calls a likely story. So he presents it as a sort of fable, right? But you can see it with hindsight as just this vision of like we're going to get an idea of what the elements are, but it's going to turn out that what distinguishes them is mathematical properties, not like things that you can grasp. Like the way you'd ordinarily grasp the properties of things. And that is what we've done, isn't it? You know, all the, the primary qualities of Descartes are the mathematical geometrical properties, but that's not an accident. And um, yeah, science is, you know, it's, it's preceded by ma making representation mathematical. And I think a large part of, I'm going to say structuralism is a stance and it, you, you emphasize that, and I think you're absolutely right to do so. So, it's around. Yeah. You, so you made that joke before, Barry, mate. Well, last time your joke was, um, everything must go to, uh, <laughs> sounds like everything must stay. I think that is what you said last time. James okay. is pointing out something in the chat window. Everyone, if you take a look <laughs> at the chat true, window. It's true, it's true. <laughs> it's Thanks, Barry. 
not anything goes. It's what science says goes. It's not anything goes. <laughs> I'm afraid I have to go right now. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. It's good to see you, Barry. So we have a couple more questions. It did sound like that in James's response to Kerry, but anything goes. Good to see you, Barry. Well, I don't think so, because I, I, but I'm just not trying to have constraints from my philosophical position here. I, I take it that science tells us what. Science provides constraints on what there is in the world. Science tells us what, what there is, not, not philosophy. I mean, not philosophy, qua philosophy. I mean, I don't know. I mean, philosophy can speculate, but it doesn't deliver the, the, the evidence. Well, I mean, I, I, I take the point of philosophy is to um, help expand our conceptual repertoire, ask questions, is to contribute to, to the project of finding out what's in the world, of course. But I think in the end, I can't see as a philosopher if I, I'm asked what there is. Uh, I'll, surely I would refer to science to answer that question. And that's not anything goes. But Barry's not listening. Is Barry still there? I'm not sure. Okay, not hearing from Barry. So um, we have a couple more questions. Uh, I do see Guido's hand, but Guido, you asked a question before, so I'd, I'd like to give an opportunity to Lev to ask the next question. Lev, please go ahead. So, uh, I want to understand the language of philosophers, and I uh, there was this workshop of structural realism, and uh, I had some naive understanding of what it is. And I had all these talks, and it wasn't my understanding at all. Uh, realism is what exists. And uh, so structural realism, realism said uh, what exists, structures, and what we talk about, objects. So I think uh, the objects are structures. This is what I think what was supposed to be. So I think table is a structure, and the cat is a structure. And uh, table and cats and uh, things and me, the structure too, uh, exist. And then uh, what I get, uh, elementary particles. Elementary particles for me as a physicist are not objects. They are kind of degrees of freedom. They are part of the theory. And then Jacob, you said the universal wave function. This is also not an object. This is everything which exists, but it's not an object. For me, objects are objects which we use. You know, this glass is an object. And this made out of many electrons. Of course, they are not objects because they're all symmetrized all over. They're all the same. There, is no, there are a few of them. And I don't think uh, that uh, the role of philosopher to help physicists to find uh, this the set of elementary particles. Who cares if God will give us these hundred particles with their properties? This is not. We want to understand what is what is our experience, what's real. So we want to understand objects of everyday uh, life. So for me, object was just uh, a cat, because a cat is particular pattern of this elementary particle. I believe the wave function, some others maybe with something else. So why is my naive understanding of structural reason? Uh, realism incorrect, or at least was not mentioned in uh, during the talk. James or Carrie or Emily. Um, um oh, go on. you go first. You go, Carrie. Or Emily, whoever that was. Yeah, that, that was me. Um, I was going to say that does, it sounds broadly like sort of Daniel Dennett real passions view, which which is precisely the argument that cats and tigers and tables and so on are to be regarded as real patterns and sort of some sort of underlying structure. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't think your, your view of structuralism is at all incorrect. I think many people would, would agree that, you know, we should think of ob uh, ordinary objects, physical objects that we, uh, that we, 
interact with as being uh, patterns and underlying structures. Um, I think the question of structural realism is kind of a further question as, as to sh should we think there are also objects on a fundamental level, or should we think that there are only structures on the fundamental level? Um, because you know, if there are if there are objects on in the fundamental level, kind of by definition, they can't be supervenient on, on patterns in the same way that cats and tables are. So that that's the question is, I guess, does that even make sense to think of there being objects at that level, or um, sh should we suppose there are only structures at that level and objects are only uh, higher up? Okay. Other other answers, which is you know from your talk, Emily, uh, you started talk about this. It was very strange for me. The probabilistic theory and realism for me it's just kind of the uh, it's uh, several light years uh, been between them. So for me, GPT has nothing to do with realism. I think it's complete. It, it's it's a, it's like cubism, like it's complete something. Very different, and for you, can, you kind of succeeded to to see uh, to see a realism here. Uh, for me, it was very very far. Well, I think I think it is, as I say, there are some obvious reasons why GPTs don't look very realist, um, and that was kind of what because I I am a realist, I, and I I wanted to understand how one could think about GPTs in a realist way. So that was that was kind of the, what you say is the motivation for the project. You know, what? how can I as a realist make sense of what this research is telling me? Because it, it does seem to be telling me something interesting. Kerry, I would like to uh, hear your reaction. Do you have a reaction to why, uh, why you consider all these electrons and whatever uh, as uh, relevant um, to reality and to well, I mean, I think what you said just sort of shows that people mean so many things by objects. I just do not think it's useful as an analytic category anymore. And that if structuralists are opposed to something, they need to find another term for what it is they're opposed to. But it's a little stronger. Uh, uh, you say stents or something like this. It is just kind of general thing. Everything goes. I'm, I'm, I hope that philosophers will help me to put some simple structure I can talk about it. Then philosophers tell me, no, no, everything goes. It's so a, you can say this. this is, I, I want black and white. Maybe I'm, uh, and I believe there is such a picture of black and white. Well, there are no unicorns there, so what? not everything goes. But you mean you want there to be some categories that are ruled out? I think that if, if there is a new kind of uh, the direction on new theory, structural realism, ontic structural realism, it should help physicists or scientists to do something. Not to say that it's absolute, that it's very very wide. You can say everything, and then we, you can you can say everything. You can say nothing. This is I, I, I want to I want to to see picture is something clarified. In the, you have the, your toy you showed, and then I was waiting. Will you say, is it an object or not? And you didn't say in the end, is it structure, or object, or whatever. I want some. Uh, I want to get forward to make more, things more clear. And excuse me from all these talks. I understand that the nature is complicated. No, I want. I want it clear. Maybe I will be wrong, but at least I want. Okay, well, I mean, I did put down some criteria for what it would be. I didn't say whether this toy was an object, but I did lay down some criteria for what it would be for an electron to be an object, which you can object to, but I did give some criteria. And then use those criteria to say, well, then this doctrine is ruled out. So it wasn't anything goes, and I didn't say you can define these categories any which way. Lev, what I, when you were talking, you, you were saying about what an object is, you were talking about things that Aristotle would call an individual substance. And, um, you know, you had your own idea about what counts to be an object, and it was, it was that, what I said, some people think object means individual, and that was what you cited as the reason why electrons weren't, weren't objects. But I think, as Carrie says, um, 
what we've learned is that you know, the term object individual, they just need to be defined in a given context and you need to say what you mean by them, otherwise they're not doing us any good. So um, there's a negative claim. Now, structuralism might help some scientists by liberating them from the need to find the fundamental object. And indeed, sometimes scientists have claimed that they have found that liberating. So, for example, um, Thomas might be going talking about the self, but it finds it helpful to not think in terms of um, a fundamental individual. Now, uh, you know, maybe that's a kind of productive way for scientists to think in different domains. I don't, I don't know. But in physics, I would have thought, you know, structural realists are trying to sort of catch up with the physicists more than tell them what to do. Because, you know, part of the idea here was that the physicists have already worked out that they have to leave behind the casting everything in terms of individuals and objects in order to do physics. And structural realists are kind of reporting that to an extent. I feel very bad about cutting off this conversation, but we do have a couple more questions. So if it's all right, uh, I, I'd like to ask if we could move on. But thanks again, Lev, for an excellent question. Um, so again, we have, we, have, so we have two questions left. Uh, Guido, I, I apologize, but I think Noel hasn't asked a question yet. So if it's all right, could Noel ask first? And then if we have time, you could ask your question. Thanks. Yeah, you could Noel, have please. You have Guido go first. That's totally fine. Okay. Uh, well, you, you both are very, being very polite and saying that the person should go first, so we need something to break the symmetry. Uh, yes. I'm here, here forth breaking the symmetry and saying, no, you should go first, and then Greta will go. Okay. Um, so this is something I just wanted to, to know a little bit more. Um, Carrie, in the middle of your talk, you mentioned that some structural realists view fields as more structurally friendly than particles. Naively, yeah. that struck me as a little bit weird. I would have thought of a field as just being a different sort of object. Than a particle. And certainly if you interpret, say, you know, particles and particle physics as excitations of a field, well, then you've got particles as patterns and something else, but the other thing that's there looks very object-like, at least to my eyes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm bummed that um, Fred Miller isn't still here because that, that you really should be asking him this question. I mean, I see it like, you know, there's a sense in which you can see fields as more structural insofar as they're less object like insofar as they're less like paradigmatic objects the objects of ordinary experience um but then you have this like graded you have this like graded scale um and it's kind of not clear where to sort of chop it off if you my point was if you have the liberty to chop it off wherever is convenient then you have a non-falsifiable thesis um yeah and in sense i mean fields i mean are quantum fields and structures are classical field structures I mean, do we, you know, we, these are the questions we face. Um, but uh, like, I mean, yeah, I, I don't want to answer that for, for Fred, but I mean, I think the same way as you. Fields have, you know, th they have the properties that we used to be associate with, um, you know, more quotidian objects, you know, they carry energy and such. And I think we should regard them as objects. But if, if somebody wants to draw on some other criterion, like it has to be localizable as their necessary condition, then who am I to, who am I to tell them? Um, I mean, all of these things are, you, I mean, I'm a pragmatist about classification anyway, but you can't tell me whether something belongs in a category and tell me why, until you tell me why it is you, that you're interested in making this categorization in the first place, right? A, a gendered body will be female for some purposes and it will be male for others, medical purposes, perhaps sporting purposes for others. Until you tell me to what end you are, you want to make this classification, I do not know where to put it. Um, so again, thinking at all times and this is why i really invite these questions i appreciate these questions from lev and others like why is this thesis important why should we care about it what work does it do when we can figure that out then we can start answering these questions but not before great thanks all right guido go ahead please and thanks for your patience yeah, no, no worries. I, I mean, it's, it's 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 a very it's a very simple question, I think, uh, and uh, uh, maybe not particularly interesting. It's for James. Um, uh, uh, I mean, you you started by uh, yeah, mentioning Putnam and no miracles, and then uh, you went on to uh, uh, talk about various examples, which were all about triangulation, you know, the Perrin example, existence of atoms. Um, 
and um, I, I, I didn't. It struck me as a uh, you know, strange, strange connection. Huh? Uh, I mean, the, 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 the Perrin example is sort of very specific, you know, different lines of evidence pointing to the existence of atoms, while um, Putnam seems um, uh, you know, more of a sort of generic argument uh, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, never thought of connecting the two. Um, right, right. So I think it's like one form of argument is like a generalization across the whole of science and the other is more like more local and um, they can be, you know, very similar. So um, so the, 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 the version of the no miracles argument I, I think of is it when it reaches its like most um, sophisticated articulation is due to Richard Boyd and for him it's Realism in general is the best explanation of not just the success of science, but the success of theory laden methods within science and theory laden, um, particularly background theories that are themselves theoretical being used to develop future theories and all of that. Um, but uh, what I was getting at with the, the just take the local example, right? so just take a particular case. Um, what I was getting at was the idea that when we say it's, um, and this is the ironic thing about human miracles really, um, when, when we say it's not a miracle, what we mean is that we think we must have latched onto the, the necessities within reality in our ability to predict. Um, so, um, I was trying to make the connection basically between between the force that people people feel from triangulation type of arguments and um, being a realist about modality. That was that was the point. Um, but I mean, I think obviously the two forms of argument are compatible. One's like a meta argument; the others are like instantiation of it in a particular case. And my claim was about um, the beginnings of science is that, you know, the, the first natural necessity that we come to understand is, is things like the simple machines and the basic processes that, that kind of bronze iron age people understood. Thanks. So I, I had one last question and it looks like that this may be the last question given that we're just about out of time. Uh, this is a question for Carrie. Um, so Carrie, you, you talked about um, masses being, uh, you know, like in the standard model, the standard model masses of the particles being, you know, potentially intrinsic properties of particles. Um, and, you know, and, and you connected this to all the many parameters, the two dozen or so parameters uh, that must have to be, you know, taken empirically or put into the standard model. Um, in, in the standard model, as we currently understand it, the masses of of all the particles, um, you know, uh, it's sort of you know prior to electroweak symmetry breaking in the very you know very hot early universe are all zero. In fact, they're they're forced to be zero by by symmetry. So in this case, a symmetry actually determines that all their masses should be zero, except for the Higgs, which which has a, a, a non-zero mass that has to be put in by hand. And then it's to the interactions of all the different particles with the Higgs that at low energies, when this underlying symmetry is hidden in the low energy, you know, cold state of our current universe, all the particles develop effective masses that arise fundamentally, according to the standard model, from interaction strengths between these fields and the Higgs. So I guess my first question is, um, I apologize for the background noise, uh, given that, that the low energy effective masses we see for these particles are ultimately derived from something that seems re relational, the interaction strengths between the different fields and the Higgs. Does that mean that the masses can be thought of as relational instead of intrinsic, at least except for the Higgs, whose mass has to be sort of put in by hand? Mm -hmm. uh, and I guess a connected question to that is interactions can be between fields, but fields can have self-interactions. 
Yes. You know, the Higgs has a self-interaction, a, a quartic yeah. self-interaction where four, you know, Higgs bosons interact with each other. Is that, from the particle point of view, that's that's relational. Higgs particles interact. From a field point of view, it's it's intrinsic to the field. So I guess mm. the lines seem kind of blurry here, and I'm just wondering yeah. if you could, you could help clarify that for me. Yeah, um, so sure. So I put up uh, a couple of references at the end um of the slides i tried to put my slides in the chat but i didn't have seem to have the option but i can send them to you um i will post all the slides yes. to the website when, when this is over oh, okay cool thank you um so uh yeah so lots of people have tried to ar have argued um that massy shouldn't be thought of if shouldn't be thought of as intrinsic because they need the higgs otherwise everything's zero but then there's a question about what about the higgs itself so one of the papers is explicitly about that um mass is you know the, we, you think about the way that it enters into the standard model it's like a self-coupling right sorry when you think about how the you know it's like a field couple a cortic um, interaction um i've argued i mean there's so many ways i think to argue that mass isn't intrinsic so i tried to do it by thinking about how um so these different ways to be extrinsic right being a sister is one way to be extrinsic because i require the existence of another entity being alone is another kind of extrinsic because i require the absence of another entity um, I have argued, and this, thinking about it, it's probably a way more convoluted argument than it needed to be, but you really can't think of mass of any particle as any field is intrinsic, because if you start having too many fields in your theory, you lose asymptotic freedom. Um, uh, so the whole thing isn't well defined anyway, like there, there just can't be too many fields in the theory and things and any coupling to not just blow up. Um, so uh, I've tried to kind of argue on those grounds that you shouldn't think of massive intri as intrinsic, although some people see that as sort of overdetermined. The fact I would I would handle differently facts about like the early universe. You know, this the shape of this phone metaphysicians will say is an intrinsic fact about it, but it's not like it didn't have somebody didn't have to bring all the bits together right in order to get it there. Um, but then you know you might worry about spin, you might worry about parity, right? Um, and if you want to be in a limited invest about objects by my criterion that nothing, none of these things can be intrinsic, right? If you want to say really these only, if, if you really identify very clearly intrinsic properties as non-structural features, there can't be any of them kicking around to be a structural realist. Um, but uh, so that definitely changes the argument that structuralism isn't supported by um, the current physics as we know it. But I'm not sure it changes, ultimately changes the idea that that it's a stance, but I'm not, I haven't thought that far ahead.